Well, good morning again, everybody. I think I got baptized myself over there. God, they got me wet, and so it's always good to uh, be able to baptize people and see people take the next step in, in their faith in Christ. Amen to that one right there? Um, if you're a first-time guest with us, or maybe you're visiting because you had some friend or relative uh, being water baptized, thank you for joining us. Uh, we like to teach the Bible here, um, which means we have a biblical worldview, and uh, currently we're in... Uh, Ephesians, uh, teaching through that book. We do Sunday morning, we do more of a theme than verse by verse. Tuesday, I teach verse by verse. We're in Joshua on Tuesdays. But in chapter 3, I titled this one, The Church, The Antidote to an Uncivilization. And the reason for that is because the chapter's on unity. And it's on the only way unity can be actually accessed in a nation, in a family, in a country. Um, I'm thoroughly convinced that um, from the last four years that we have learned how to be very uncivil toward each other. Any amens? Uh, it's very much a, a pandemic. I think it's the real pandemic. It's one of the real pandemics. Um, I watched in the last four years, especially four years ago, when people would cut family members off and... Um, There'd be so many attacks on social media, and I, and I watched Christians do this. It really quenched me. I'm thinking, yeah, I mean, come on, Christian. Don't, don't be doing this kind of stuff here. And, uh, and now we're in election year again, and, and you know, I, I, just, I, I just don't really like things like this now to watch uh, uncivilized, angry people just go at each other. I, I don't like it at all. But when I look and I see this kind of stuff, I'm not shocked by it. I, I'm not shocked. In fact, I expect it. You say, why would you expect it? Well, because Jesus, two reasons, Jesus makes a statement. He says in the last days, as we know them right now, uh, he said, there's many things to look for, but in the um, birth pangs leading up to the birth of the final thing, he says the love of many will grow cold. And we're seeing that people's love, they've lost love for each other. And you've seen it in some of your own families. Um... But then he also, in those few verses, a few verses later, Jesus makes a statement. He says that there would be kingdom against kingdom, and we see country against country. But he said there would also be nation against nation. In other words, a nation against itself. There would be this civil unrest. And we're seeing it, and we've seen it pretty crazily in these last four years. Calm down just a bit right now. And... Um, that's one reason why I expect it. The other reason why it, do, it doesn't shock me is I'm kind of a very amateur, amateur, amateur historian. Uh, some of you are pro-historians. When I go on a long drive by myself, which I did this week, I went off to continue writing the first book I'm writing. I had a 250-mile drive each way, and I like to listen to a historian talk about a certain period of history. I like things like Hitler and the rise of Nazism. I like to learn about that. Babylon, the Roman Empire, Genghis Khan, the Assyrian Empire, the French Revolution. I just like stuff like that. And the things that I've learned as I listen to them is that there's a common denominator in that history keeps repeating itself. Has anyone ever noticed that? It just keeps repeating itself, which tells me that Satan has no new place. He runs the same place. You say, well, I don't believe in Satan, Jim. Okay, that, fine. Just because you don't believe in him doesn't mean he doesn't exist. You're not the source of all truth. Um, but he has no new place whatsoever. And I'm really hoping this year, I doubt it, but I'm hoping that we won't see a repeat from journalists and politicians and leaders. And all they do is they really seek to divide us regular people out here. Any amens on that one? I, I mean, that, that's what they do. And see, one of the things that we've lost in our country is you don't have to agree with me and I don't have to agree with you for us to be friends and for us to be civil with each other, correct? If we would just go back to the true meaning of tolerance, because you know the word tolerant doesn't mean that anymore in America. Tolerance now means if you don't agree with me, I'm going to cut you off or you're going to get fired or something like that. That's the new definition of tolerance and it's a lie. True tolerance says, you can disagree with me, I can disagree with you. I can go have lunch with you afterwards. I, don't even, I won't even be mad at you at all. 
Because we live in a country that we're supposed to be free and it's supposed to be sharing our ideas. Any amens? When we're not allowed to do that, just think about this. Then business will begin to erode because if you're only bringing in people that think just like you and you're racing everybody else, then you're eliminating all kinds of new ideas within the business, correct? And that's one reason, in my strong opinion, for my, my beloved Marvel movie cinematic is, is just gone down the tube because they've just gone down they've gone down these roads so today the big deal in my teaching out of Ephesians chapter 3 is that um, and by the way I'm going to tell you I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say right now I'm going to offend some of you in this room it's just going to happen but I will always tell you the truth you don't have to you don't have to agree with me but I will tell you the truth but we're going to look at in how in Christ, the church, and I don't mean a building, I mean the church, people that have given their life to Christ, followers of Christ, jumped in two feet and said, Jesus is absolutely the only God. He was crucified, and he did rise from the dead, and I follow him, and I obey the word of God. That's who I'm talking to when I say church. But in church, we are one big happy family. We have our differences, but we're one big happy family. Any amens? I mean, the thing that I like about church is we're just a mixture. I'm a Mexican-American. You're a European-American. You're African-American. You're Asian-American. Native American. Which, by the way, let me offend somebody right now. There's no one native to America, okay? If you believe the Bible and God's truth, you know that Noah came off the ark. Plenty of evidence for a worldwide flood. Don't believe it out than what they say out there. But Shem, Ham, and Japheth, if you follow the Bible, you, you could see where they went. There was nobody in this land. Eventually somebody came here. But nobody started here like some evolutionary process. Bloop, there we are. That's just not true. So you can get mad at me at that one right off the top. I'll give you a free one right there, okay? Um, notice uh, I didn't say when I named all the different ethnicities, I didn't say different races. Because there are no different races, that's, that's a man-made thing. It doesn't jive with the Bible. Put it, Acts 17, 26. It says this, notice what God's word says, and as a Christian, I hold to a biblical worldview. Any amens out there? And he made from one man, every nation of mankind, to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation. So God made from Adam, and thus then Eve, he made all people generation after generation after generation you follow me so far that means we all have this one set of parents Adam and Eve which means and I like to say this that if you're married you married a relative distant but a relative okay <laughs> that's what you did I'm just telling you right now right you might look at your spouse a little bit differently now but we all came from Adam and Eve 6,000 years ago, not millions and millions of years ago. There's not one bone, not one shred of any in-between species that proves evolution. There's nothing, guys. There's nothing like that. It's a theory that is that people have to toe that line or else they get fired or don't get papers published, etc., etc., etc. Now, um, which means this. Uh, since we all came from those two, no matter what shade of skin color we are, we're all family. Any amens? Yes. And the church is a thing that brings the family back together. You say, well, somebody's going to say, well, Jim, how come there's different shades? First off, everybody, I don't care how light or dark skin you are, everybody is a shade of brown. Did you know that? Scientifically, biologically, melanin is brown. That's in your skin. And whatever, however much melanin you retain, that's your skin color. I hate the terms white, brown, black, because no one is this color. No one is this color. We're all brown, some shade of brown, and that's it. Well, Jim, how did it all happen? Well, when they come off the ark, there was no planes, trains, and automobiles. Remember that? And then you have the Tower of Babel. Remember that? And then God spreads them out. Languages are confused. And when you don't communicate with each other, you tend to separate and go with the people you know. And now, in the land of no planes, trains, and automobiles, you're distant from each other, and therefore the gene pool stays in that, area, in that kind of gene pool there, and that's how you get the different looks, different shades of people. Amen to that one? That's as far as I can go on that one, because I don't have time to go any further on that. Now, <clears throat> so 
when you put all this together, um, and by the way, every one of us is 99 and like 9 tenths percent exactly the same. There's no differences in us whatsoever. Or you, one tenth of a percent. Well, I'm going to give you one. Don't get offended by this one. But if, if you're Asian, you might have the Asian island. Amen? Which I think looks pretty cool. But I wish I had it, but I don't. Um, but that's just the, the little things are different. But we're all the same. We're all biologically the same, my friend. So when you start looking at all this, and you see all the division out there, and they're fighting over things, you realize, and we're going to find out in Scripture today, that the church, us, the body of Christ, the followers of Christ, we are the antidote to an uncivilization. We're the only thing that, can, that, that, will, that will save or at least point people in the right direction. You're not going to get it from leaders. You're not going to get it from journalists. You're not going to get it from all the angry people on social media. You're not going to get it. But you will get it in the Bible. I haven't offended you yet, but hold on, okay? I'm going to give you three things today, if you're taking notes. I'm going to give you the mystery, I'm going to give you the minister, and I'm going to give you the membership. Now, if you're taking notes, look at your point two. I should have added verse 10. I didn't. It ends at verse 9 on Ephesians 3, but add a verse 10 in there for yourself. Now, number one, the mystery. All followers of Christ are fellow heirs in one family. In other words, we're one big happy family in the body of Christ. Now, let's read Ephesians chapter 2, 19. I'm going to back up three verses in Ephesians 4. I'll read chapter 3, verse 6. It says this. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are, the, are of God's household. Say household. household. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles. Say foundation. foundation. And prophets. Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building, building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. Say Spirit. spirit. Let me show you quickly, not any notes in those verses right there. First off, we are fellow citizens in God's household. That, that right there, that's family, right? Yes. The foundation is the prophets in Jesus Christ. Now we have foundation. We have family and foundation. You follow me? Yes or no? And then at the end of verse 22, in the spirit, we have the spirit dwelling in us, right? That's, we're filled. So we have family, foundation, and filling. We all have the same filling, okay? On the inside, we're all the same. We're like Twinkie, all the same inside, okay? Just so you get that. Now, verse 1 through 6 of chapter 3. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, notice he's a prisoner, for the sake of you, the Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery. Say mystery. mystery. It's a big one. As I wrote before in brief, by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it is now uh, been revealed to the holy apostles and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, that the Gentiles, say Gentiles, Gentiles. are fellow heirs, say fellow heirs, fellow heirs, and fellow members of the body, and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Now there's a load right there, guys. So I have to simplify because we stay thematic on Sunday mornings. So what he's saying is this. All these verses, they're family of God verses. Have you ever... As a Christian, follower of Christ, and I'm talking the real deal. Have you ever been in another state or maybe another country and you run into a real Christian? Have you ever done that? Nobody's ever done that. Raise your hand if you've ever done that. Okay, good. You got to get out more often, okay? I have. And then as soon as I start talking with them, they start talking with me. In a matter of seconds, it feels like I've known them all my life. Like I just saw them at the family picnic this past Sunday. And why is that? Why is it that I can have such a uh, common denominator with them? I've never met them, known them for about 28 seconds, and now all of a sudden I know them like I've known them all my life. Why is that I can do that? Because we have a common denominator in our lives, and that is Jesus Christ. That's what it is. And we have something so unique in this body of Christ that the world doesn't have. Have you ever thought this? That when you and I, of all our different ethnicities, when we get along, that we proclaim the testimony of Jesus Christ to an uncivilized society. 
Have you ever thought that? Because that's exactly what we're doing as we come together. Now, Paul is writing from prison, and he says that he's got the revelation of the mystery. Say mystery. Now, mystery, that Greek word, is not the idea that you can't know it. It's the idea that it's unknown until it is revealed. So Paul has now been revealed to him the mystery. Now, what is the mystery that Paul is talking about? This is the crux of today in this message. He says that the Gentiles, which is everybody who's not a Jew, that's me, and the Jews are fellow heirs in Christ. Do you know how radical that statement is in that day? Do you know how much trouble Paul can get into in that statement in that day? Let me tell you, for those who don't know, the Jews hate the Gentiles. They don't want to be around them. Man, if a Gentile comes in and he was in their home, they got to clean everything because they feel like they're unclean. In fact, a Jew thought that a Gentile in that day was only good for kindling the fires of hell. That's what they thought. And so now, you got these people that bas- they basically hate each other, but in Christ, they can come together in the church and be family members and civil and love each other. Is that amazing or what? Let me take you further. If you have your Bible, not in your notes, look at chapter 2, verse 14. It says, For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one, both groups, Jew, Gentile, into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. That's an allusion, possibly, to in the temple in that day, there was a court of the Jews, only Jewish people, men could go there, and a court of the Gentiles, only Gentile men could go there, and there was a sign that said, Gentiles, if you walk past this point into the court of the Jews, you will die. In other words, you stay separate. We keep you far away from us. That's how bad this deal was. Now, So Jesus now, we find, is able to bring two people groups that oppose each other, that don't like each other, that don't get along with each other, that have a history of not liking each other. He can bring them all together. And they can actually like each other. That's the mystery. Paul is in prison. Do you know why? Because they said that he brought a Gentile in the temple. He didn't do that, but he is hanging out with Gentiles. And he's reaching them for Christ. So he is a turncoat to his own ethnicity in their minds. That's a scary one for some of us ethnicities, huh? To be a turncoat? I really don't care. I really don't care what my ethnicity says. I care what God says. That's all I care about. Because my ethnicity is wrong in many situations. I like what Charles Barkley said about four years ago when everything's going crazy. He said this. I I wrote it down because that that, that was so good. He said, it's the politicians that create division. All of us out here get along fine. And I thought, that's so true. I go Charles for president. (laughs) Okay, let me drill down. Point one's a long point. You get catching that so far? There's an ideology that's being spread in our culture. And it's, it's a lie. It's from the pit of hell. It's the ideology that uh, is being pushed that our society is really broke up into oppressor and oppressed. Have you ever heard that one? Have you heard it? It's, it's permeating society right now. I'm not going to pull any punches with you on, that one, on this one. What, it, what they're really saying is this. That the oppressors in America are my lighter-skinned European descent Anglo friends. Right? It's not, don't be afraid to say amen in here, okay? Because I'll go to war and fight for you on that one, okay? No. But that's such a divisive statement in America, and it, and it bugs me so much, that they're somehow oppressing me or something like that. Now, I am not saying that it wasn't that way a long, long time ago. I can still remember. I know, I know it's a song. <laughs> Some of you have no clue what that song is. <laughs> but what I'm telling you is this. As a Mexican-American, and by the way, I'm a Christian first, then I'm an American who happens to be Mexican descent. Just so you know where I stand. The red on that flag, my father shed blood in World War II, and I will never bow my knee to that flag. You got me right there? 
<clears throat> just so you know where I stand. But let me tell you this. I am Mexican American. I am not oppressed by lighter skinned people. They, they, no, one, no one's oppressing me. They are not my enemy. They will never be my enemy. But here's the danger. Because that's all disunity stuff. Here's the danger. You know that thought? The oppressor of oppression is coming to the church in different places. Did you know that? There's pastors giving into that. I'm not giving into that. And that's dangerous. And here's how they go about it. To try to bend it into the church. Luke chapter 4. This is Jesus' mission statement that when he proclaims publicly that he is the one and here he's come. This is what he says. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set free those who are oppressed. louder, are oppressed. oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, which is jubilee. We don't have time for that one. Now, they say, look, Jesus came to set the oppressed free. Misinterpretation of how they're reading it. You know who the oppressed are? Every one of us. Oppressed by Satan, oppressed by sin, and oppressed by ourselves. We can oppress ourselves. That's who it's talking about. He came to set us all free. We we'll say, well, well, Jim, you know, God is, is, is not, he would never oppress so this and that. Riddle me this one, Batman. Amen. Jeremiah 29. This is God's word. Watch this. Now these are the words of the letter which Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the rest of the elders of the exile. They're in exile in Babylon, the Jews are. The priests, the prophets, and all the people who Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jeconiah and the queen mother and the court officials and the princes of Judah and Jerusalem and the craftsmen and the smiths and had, had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elisa, the son of Shephan, and Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah. How many are glad I'm reading it out loud, not you? <laughs> Whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, was sent, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, saying, now watch. They're in prison, basically. They're in exile. They've been deported, the Jews, and they're under the oppression of the Babylonians. Now watch. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles, all the Jews that have been deported, whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Who sent them into oppression? Louder? God did. And that's interesting, right? But why did he send them into oppression? Because they sinned. Because they turned against God. Because they knew better and they followed false gods. That's why he sent them there. <clears throat> so if you have this idea that God's for oppressed, oppressed, you get that out of your head. The problem is you drink instead of think. You drink the Kool-Aid instead of think biblically. See, the oppression is the oppressor was Satan, sin, and ourselves. Now, <clears throat> can I drill down further and offend somebody here? Okay, good, because I was going to. I'm going to speak to you now as a Latino Christian. And I say that the same way I tell my son that, who's a teacher in the school system, who's Mexican, and I say, they can't call you a racist, Nathan, you're Mexican. Only white people are racist. Remember that in America? Right? Am I right? That's exactly what it is right now. And everybody in this room, you know that in your ethnicity, I don't care what ethnicity, there are racists in your ethnicity too, right? I know Mexicans who are racist against other Mexicans. Any Mexicans know what I mean by that? Yeah, so don't tell me that, oh, that's the only group with that sin. Shut up. It says all temptation that has taken us, it's common to man. So either God's right or you're right. I'll take God on that one right there. So I'm going to speak to you as a Latino Americano. An observation that really bugs me. My European light-skinned friends, whom I love very much, as I love any ethnicity whatsoever. But 
doesn't it just get you that you've watched on TV, or especially about two, three years ago, all these, what you call it? They call it virtue signaling. All these European light-skinned actors and actresses apologizing for their whiteness. Anybody seen those? Raise your hand. Come on, tell me if you've seen that. I just want to throw a rock at the TV. They're apologizing for their white privilege. I, I got a question. And they're asking forgiveness for that. I have a question. Who made them that color? Louder? Louder? Oh, God did. So God made a person a lighter shade. So all of a sudden they're apologizing for that? No, no, no. No, no. Okay. Now, <clears throat> let me say this and let me say this. It's going back to the oppression, apologize for all that. That's ridiculous. Okay. Let me talk to my, I'll just speak as, as a Latino, Mexican, okay? So nobody can call me a racist. My Latino uh, ethnicities out there, please. Don't use all the mumbo-jumbo, lying, deceitful dialogue, Kool-Aid of the culture, to give yourself an excuse for not excelling in life. Amen. I don't feel sorry for you. I feel sorry for the person in a hospital somewhere because they were born with so many handicaps and they can't do anything. But I don't feel sorry for you. Adam says to God, it was, the, it was the woman that you gave me. He's trying to blame God. Don't blame anybody. God says, no, 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 no. You're not going to be blaming people. So do not blame others. Do not feel sorry for yourself. Don't do that. Okay, so remember um, uh, about, uh, I'm still in point one, right? <laughs> I told you it's a long point, okay? The other ones are real fast, I promise. You'll get out for lunch. Okay, you guys remember about three, four years ago, I was, I was up on a 15-foot ladder with a long extension and a, chain, a chainsaw. Anybody remember that one? And I was cutting off the po- those long pods about this tall off my queen palms. You know what those are, right? They're like torpedoes from heaven. They weigh about 60 pounds. And so I have this big scar right here. Zoom in, it's beautiful. No, don't zoom in. And I was up there, and Olivia's holding the ladder. And I, I was cutting one down, and it came down. It's coming right at me. And I turned my head. Thank God it didn't hit my head, because I wouldn't even be here right now. It caught me in the arm. And, oh, and I jumped off the ladder, you know, like, like Iron Man landing. No, I didn't. I just wanted to do that, okay? just wanted to do that one, okay? I just... So, um, and so I had to be taken in an ambulance to the hospital. I was like, I, and out, every, all the neighbors come out. I was, I'm, this is so embarrassing, sister. But it was cut all the way open, and no blood at all, which led me to believe I must be a vampire. No, I didn't. <laughs> so um, the ambulance, hospital, everything. When I always, this is what I do wherever I run into, go place like that, or if I run into somebody with some kind of a different accent from another country. But in, I was in the hospital, I go, and all these nurses and doctors, everything, and I noticed There's a lot of medium and dark-skinned people working in this hospital. Nurse positions, doctors, everything else. It's interesting to me. So the ones I get to talk to, I say, hey, so did you always know you wanted to be this? Well, yeah. I go, how'd you get here? And they all say the same. It was hard. I wanted to quit, but I kept going, and I kept working, and it paid off. And now I'm a nurse or a doctor or whatever specialist they are. And I think, wow, what a shock. Hard work pays off in America. (laughs) No matter what ethnicity you are. So this mumbo-jumbo out there, is mumbo-jumbo still a term or am I bringing it back? (laughs) Do you know, in America, because you know it's oppression, that people from India and people from Nigeria are some of the highest wage earners in America. Did you know that? Do you know why? Mom and dad in the home, unlike America, it's all busted because what Johnson did back in the 60s with the welfare program, 
A man can go have as many kids with as many women they want. The government keeps paying the woman, and the guy can keep going and have more kids. Did you know that? Did you know that? Indian and Nigerian families, two parents in the home. Very disciplined, kids respectful, education high priority. They do not let the crazy culture affect them. And therefore, each generation rises up and it's not uncommon to see a doctor, a dentist, or this, in all the families. How's that happen? Well, I told you how that happens. They work hard. They do the right thing. This is not an oppressive nation. You want to be something? Then work for it. Work, work hard for these things. Now, oh, I've got to move fast. Okay. Now, I, I, that's enough for point one. You guys got my, my gist so far? Okay, so i got to move on. Okay, point two, the minister. This is going to be real quick. Okay, the minister. They are the torch bearers. The minister torch. Now look at verses 7, 8, 9, and 10. And it says this. Uh, of which I, this is Paul speaking. Of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace. Say made. made. Which was given to me according to the working of his power. To me, the very least of all saints, the grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ. And to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things. So that the manifold, say manifold, manifold. the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the, church. the church. church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. Now, here's what Paul basically is saying. Ministers, we're the torch bearers. We bring the light of God's word and specifically here, the mystery that Jew and Gentile, that everybody can come together in the body of Christ, we're fellow heirs, one family. Uh, but wait, New Testament teaches, yes, I'm a pastor, but everybody's actually a minister of the gospel in the New Testament. Did you know that? So everybody that names the name of Jesus Christ, you are a torchbearer, and one of your torchbearing things to do is bring this message that in Christ, we all love each other, we can have unity, because we all know where we came from, Adam and Eve. Any amens of that? Amen. Now, Verse 10, I'll give you a fun one. It says, he brings the manifold wisdom of God. Manifold. What does that mean? Manifold is the idea of multicolored. Is Jesus the light? Yes. Okay. Do you know in light, there are colors? How many knew that? There's light and color. That's why when you see a rainbow, light has went through the droplets. It's dispersed into its different color wavelengths. And now you see the colors. So you see all those colors, that's actually in light. But when it goes through the water, like Holy Spirit in our lives, then you see the different colors. It's multicolored. That's the same thing that's true for us. That we're a multicolored group of people in the kingdom of God. All broken, but we're in here, right? And that's why I don't like that they've stolen the rainbow around the, for, that's on the throne of God in Revelation and they used it for unsacrilegious purposes in our society because the rainbow, it's a picture of all of us ethnicities, different shades of brown, coming together to form the magnificent body of Christ. Any amens? That's good enough right there, right? Now, number three. Number three, I'm doing good now. What's it? It's because you all got baptized. You took my time. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. The membership. Our family consists of one father. Watch this. Verse 14, 15. Paul speaks and he says, For this reason I bow my knees before the, uh, the father. Not uh, one of many fathers. No, the father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Woo! We have one father. Jew and Gentile. Mexican American. Asian American. African American. Native American. I didn't hopefully leave you out American. <laughs> when you put your name on the dotted line for Jesus Christ, you have one father and so do I. That's just what it is, guys. Let me show you heaven, Revelation 7, 9. Watch heaven. This is a heaven verse. When we're all in there, watch this. After these things I look, John the, the revelator is writing to one of the 12 disciples. And behold, a great multitude, this is heaven, guys, which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues. Is that kind of like all the ethnicities? 
standing before the throne and before the Lamb. The Lamb is Jesus. The throne is where God the Father sits. Clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands. Question, what does that tell you about heaven? No, there is color in heaven. It says where all the ethnicities are going to be there. Did you catch that? And the church is a picture of that. At least it should be. That we get along. That we have one dad. Let me close off by taking you back to Forrest Gump. <laughs> if, it's your, if it's your first time here, this is like a trend. I'm, I'm, I'm a movie guy. They all know this. Do you remember when Forrest and Bubba get to Vietnam? Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's a great scene. And they meet Lieutenant Dan. Remember Lieutenant Dan? <laughs> and they're standing there. Lieutenant Dan's giving him initial instructions. And then he asks him, here's... Forrest, who's like European uh, descent, and here's Bubba, African-American descent, and they're standing there looking for Lieutenant Dan. Lieutenant Dan says, where are you guys from? They say, in unison, they say, Alabama. (laughs) And then Lieutenant Dan says, what are you, twins? (laughs) And then remember, they look at each other like they got a check? (laughs) And they look back at Lieutenant Dan? And then do you remember what Forrest says? He says, Uh, We are not related, sir. (laughs) Incorrect. They are related. They have Adam and Eve as their first ancestors. They are related. So one day. Oh, I got time. a scary thought Jesus is walking from the north to the south in Israel and he comes to a place called Samaria you can read about it in the New Testament gospel of John chapter 4 he sends his disciples away and he sits there by a well in the heat of the day it's like noontime they go to get food a woman comes, comes walking up. We know her as the Samaritan woman. Jesus initiates conversation by saying, give me a drink. And she says, how is it you ask me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? You know the Jews have no dealings with us Samaritans. Right at that moment, you realize there's a big schism. Samaritans and Jews don't get along. They don't like each other. There's a history. Because a Samaritan in the northern area, middle north area of Israel, they're considered a half-breed to the Jews because when the Assyrians invaded the northern kingdom, they intermarried with them, and thus the Samaritans were birthed. But the Jews are full blood, Jews in the south here. So now you see there's this racial thing going on there. They don't get along with each other. And then the conversation gets deeper. She tries to lie to Jesus. But you can't lie to Jesus. He knows everything. And he tells her the truth about herself, about her sin, because you have to come to admit that you are a sinner before a holy God or else you can't be saved. Because you can't, if you don't confess your sin, he can't wash away your sin by his blood. A certain point she says this. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain. She's near Mount Gerizim. But you people say that in Jerusalem is a place where people ought to worship. Notice what she just did. See, the Samaritans, when they had their area there, they didn't want any of their people to go to Jerusalem and worship at the temple. They built their own temple at Mount Gerizim to keep their people there. Been there for a long time now. So she says... Our fathers worship in this mountain. We worship here at Mount Gerizim. But you people, you say that Jerusalem is a place to worship, which is the right place to worship. That's where the temple is. So what she's saying is, no, no, we disagree here. We're two different people. My father, our father said this. And when she says, our fathers, 
worshiped in this man. This is what she's saying. This is what my daddy told me. This is what my granddaddy told me. This is what my great granddaddy told me. And this is what my great great granddaddy told me. That this is what it is. And then Jesus. He says, Woman, it's like my lady, woman. The time is coming and now is. And now is. When the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Here's what Jesus just said to her. You want to talk about your daddy? I'm going to talk to you about my daddy. Because my daddy is God the Father. He is our Father. And lady, it doesn't matter what your daddy said. It doesn't matter what your granddaddy said. It doesn't matter what your great granddaddy taught. It doesn't matter. If what they said disagrees with this word of God and the Father in heaven, then they're wrong and this is right. That's what he just told the woman. And as a born-again Christian of Mexican descent, and whatever descent you are as a born-again Christian, you're a torchbearer. You're called to reveal the mystery that it doesn't matter what ethnicity a person is, the body of Christ is the true picture of heaven. That we can get along because we have one Father, one foundation, Jesus, and one filling, the Spirit of God. And we're to carry that thing because we're members of that family. And that is our calling. Because you see, church is the only answer to an uncivilization. It's the only answer. There is no answer. They have no answers out there. It's just this. Now with that said, it's no accident you're here today. There are no accidents in life. It's not a coincidence. If you've never placed your faith in Jesus, then maybe today's the day. Now let me tell you what that means. It means you must believe that Jesus is the only, only God. You say, well, all roads lead to God. No, sorry about that, friend. That's a law of non-contradiction. You can't have two opposing truths both be true. You can't. Jesus came down to you and me on the, on the go to the cross because we couldn't make it to him through any good works at all. Can't get there. So he came down to us, and he's God. He's the creator of it all. But he came down in human form. And he goes to the cross, death, carries your sins and mine. And I appreciate that. Because every one of us in this room who's an adult, you've committed about 50,000 sins. Don't pretend you haven't. And they kill him as that blood stripping from his body that forgives sins. And they bury him. And three days later, he blows that tomb wide open. Oh, Jim, how, you believe in a resurrection. He came back from dead. Listen, friend. Jerusalem's not a big city at that time. Fifty days later, the church is born based on the resurrection of Christ, death and resurrection. There's plenty of people that wanted to stop that movement. How does it get off the ground with 3,000 people coming to Christ that day? The people that didn't want that to get off the ground, they could have just gone 500 yards, got the dead body out of a tomb, dragged it around and said, look, he didn't rise from the dead. Why didn't they do that? Because it wasn't there. He rose from the dead. Think logically. Quit. Don't drink the culture. Think the scriptures. And so Jesus comes for you. And he wants to save you. I gave my life to Christ 40-something years ago. I've never regretted it. Well, Jim, I'm, I'm, I'm involved in a lot of stuff. So was I. So was I. And I knew I needed the Savior. And you do too. So if you've never given your life to Christ, or maybe... You backslid. And you need to get it right, man. You need to get it right. And today's your day. I want you all to close your eyes and no moving around, please. Christians, please pray. If you'd like to receive Christ this morning, put your faith in Him. 
and become a follower of Christ, or you'd like to rededicate your life to Christ because you, you've distanced yourself from him, you, you've walked away. If you're in either one of those two positions and you want to put your faith in Christ or rededicate your life, I want you to open up your eyes right now look up at me. Look up at me. And I'm going to look back at you. When our eyes meet, you can close them, but do it right now. Do it right now. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Mm -hmm. God bless you. 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 Mm hmm. Mm hmm. God bless you and you. Now, I want you to say that, of those who looked up at me, I want you to say this prayer. And everyone's going to say it with you. You're not alone. Now, as you say it, you got to believe it. Deity, death, resurrection. Jesus is God. He did die on a cross. And he did rise from the dead. So here we go. Those who looked up, repeat after me. Because you're about to receive the Holy Spirit in your life. And your sins are about to be washed away. And you're about to become a son or a daughter of God right now. With one father. Christians say it with them. Here we go. Thank you, Jesus, for loving me so much that you would die for me and take my place on a cross. Thank you for shedding your blood to forgive my sins. Forgive me of my sins, and I know I'm forgiven. Come into my life, Holy Spirit. Today I choose to follow you with my entire life and make the Bible the guidebook of my life. Thank you for saving me. Now let me pray. God, I pray for everybody looked up. Lord, this is the most glorious burning bush moment of their life. I pray for you, friend who looked up. You can't just walk away and not follow up because God knows everything. Get yourself in a church. If you're from out of town, find a church that teaches the Bible, the, the actual Bible. If you're from around here, get in a church here. Jump into fellowship. Start reading the Word. If you don't have a Bible, you can get one from our prayer partners or in the lobby afterwards. Stay in the New Testament for a couple years to read about your Savior. Thank you, God, for this day. Thank you for saving people. Thank you for everything you did, all the baptisms, everything else. In Jesus' name we pray. And we all said? Amen, amen and amen. Stand up with me, everybody. If you looked up at me for that, just remember, I would invite you, I should say, to go. We have prayer partners left over here. Do yourself a favor. Let them pray for you for a minute. And they'll let you go. They're not going to hold you, okay? But do yourself a favor to get a good start. If somebody, you came with somebody who got saved, take them over there, please. Now, if you have any prayer needs at all, they're there for you also. Whatever you need prayer for. Physical offerings, you know, over there and over there. Remember a few things. Men, uh, this Saturday is our men's breakfast. I'm teaching through Elijah in 1 Kings. We have a good time up there, 8 o'clock on Saturday, less an hour and a half. And we feed you. What a deal. Um, and then trivia night, Friday night, go online, sign up for that. Men, we need to sign up for the breakfast too so we know how much food to make. So here we go. Repeat after me. Lord, keep me outward focused. And fill me with your spirit. Give me the boldness to share the gospel with others. Open up opportunities to minister outside the church because I see what I'm looking for and make me into a generous person like you. Hey, God bless you guys. Have a great day. We'll see you some point this week.